Hey everyone, welcome to the question show. Your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you are across my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down, gather them up, and I will answer them here. Now, as always, I record this show every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. So if you want to catch the show live, you can ask questions, ask follow up questions. And it's a lot of fun. We do this again every Monday at 5 p.m. And there should be a link to the next show somewhere around here on my channel or go to the channel homepage, you should see a, a notification for it. But of course, like, like subscribe to the channel, click the bell, and make sure you subscribe to the newsletter to get all the announcements. So all right, let's get into the questions. Crow T robot 313. Everyone describes black holes by their mass, it's almost never mentioned what their diameters are. Is there a rule of thumb about how large a black hole is in comparison to the sun? Are solar mass black holes a quarter of the diameter half size? What about supermassive black holes? You can really only measure black holes by two things, their mass and their spin. That's it. And so from that, you can essentially calculate everything else that's going on with the black hole. And, you know, when you talk about the size of a black hole, you're really talking about the size of the event horizon, the region, the point at which nothing, not even light can escape the grasp of the black hole. I mean, the actual black hole itself that's inside the event horizon, it could be tiny, it could be infinitely small, it could be almost the size of the event horizon, we just don't know. And we may never know. And so when you're talking about the size of the black hole, you're talking about the event horizon. And that's kind of confusing. Because it's like you're saying, like, how big is the black hole? And if you talk to a physicist, you say, how big is a black hole? They'll go like, we don't know. And then you and then you say, Well, how big is the event horizon of the black hole? And they'll go, Well, that we know. Um, and so we're gonna have to talk about the size of the event horizon. And there's a very specific, very relatively straightforward math to calculate the event horizon size of the black hole compared to the mass. If you know the mass of your black hole, you can calculate the event horizon. And I like to use Wolfram Alpha as doing a lot of the calculations that I do for some of the shows. And so if you just type in Wolfram Alpha black hole mass sun, you get the event horizon radius of 2953 meters, in other words, three kilometers. So if you had a black hole with the mass of the sun, which you can't, then you would have it would be six kilometers across would have a radius of three kilometers. Now, if you had a black hole that had 10 times the mass of the sun, which is a more normal size, then you'd have an event horizon that is 29 kilometers in radius. In other words, it would be 60 kilometers across. And if you had a black hole that was a 1000 times the mass of the sun, then you'd have an event horizon that is 2953 kilometers radius. So 6000 kilometers across. And so you can see this number just goes up. And so you can just go run this math. And you can see it's a very linear progression as the mass of the black hole goes up, the size of the event horizon goes up. Josh DeRoos. Hey, Fraser, I watch a lot of astronomy content, including yours. But one area that doesn't seem to be talked about is the coordinate system that is used to locate known objects in the universe. It must be complex considering that the Earth is rotating and orbiting the sun. So everything we observe is also moving relative to us. Can you give us the cliff notes explanation? I have done this a bit in the past, but I'll do it again. And I'll make it a little little bit more complicated this time around. So to measure the location of objects in the sky, astronomers measure it kind of like it's a giant sphere that is going around the Earth. And then they measure the position of all of these objects as to where they are on this giant sphere. And they have two numbers that they use to measure one is right ascension, and the other is declination. And they're kind of like latitude and longitude, but for space. Declination is the angle above or below the equator. So if you take the Earth's equator, and you spread it out into space, and then you measure the angle up and down, that gives you your declination, you can be above the equator or below the equator. And then right ascension is astronomers take a, an arbitrary line in space it happens to be the March equinox. And then they measure away, essentially from that line in in a circle around the radius of the Earth. And then from that, you can you can know where any object is, you know, how far away it is from the March equinox, and then you know how high it is against the equator. And that gives you a very specific point, they'll measure like a chunk of sky a degree like the moon is half a degree in the sky. And astronomers separate that up into minutes, they'll separate that into seconds into arc seconds into micro arc seconds, just get smaller and smaller and smaller. And we can use that to, to essentially 
target the location of every single object that you can see in the sky. And because things don't really move that quickly, that's pretty much fine. For some objects that are really close. Yeah, if you're on one side of the sun, when the Earth is on one side of the sun, you could measure the position of some object. And then when you're on the other side of the sun, you could measure the position of that object again, and it might move a tiny little bit. And astronomers use this to essentially measure the distance using trigonometry to how far away those objects are. But I think what you're getting at is there like some other form of measurement that because like you could measure two stars, one which is 10 light years away and one which is a 1000 light years away, and they're going to be right beside each other in the sky, they're gonna have very similar coordinates, but that doesn't really tell us how far away they are. So there is another method that has been developed, it's called the galactic coordinate system. And in this case, imagine you take the Earth, and you run a line from the Earth through the center of the Milky Way and out into space. And that is the galactic longitude. And then you measure a circle going around the Milky Way from that point, and then you can measure outward in various directions from that. And so you can measure like your distance to Andromeda, you know, sort of how far off it is this angle above below, and then the distance and you're able to determine where things are out in space. But you know, that's only really going to matter, I guess, in the future, when we're actually like flying to other worlds and starting to navigate, then we'll have to come up with some new navigation system that that works better. Although it's a little like, solar centric because the center of the universe is is the sun. But you know, maybe we'll we'll figure that out. Or maybe it will always be the sun into the future. Explosive Apple one. Hey, Fraser, what created the gravitational waves that formed the first stars when the universe was nothing but gas, or the regions of higher and lower density of gas that formed the stars that then made up more stars? You essentially gave the answer there with your question, which is that in the earliest universe, before there were even stars, even before the cosmic microwave background radiation was released, there was just this soup of hydrogen and helium just left over from the formation of the universe. But it wasn't equal density, If it was equal density, then as the universe expanded, all of these particles would, would expand outward at sort of the perfect balance, and you wouldn't end up with any stars, and you wouldn't end up with any galaxies. But there were these slight densities, over densities and under densities, and those led to the formation of large galaxy clusters, proto galaxies, and eventually stars within those regions. And so like, literally, it was just the densities that were left over from the formation of the universe. And when you look at the cosmic microwave background radiation, and you see the regions of different temperatures, those temperatures match areas in the universe that have galaxy clusters, essentially, they are showing how what was originally over densities and under densities and, and essentially higher and lower temperatures turned into places where there are galaxies and places where there aren't HPA 97. If planet nine is a primordial black hole, wouldn't it be almost impossible to detect it due to having an incredibly small event horizon? So one of the explanations for planet nine is that it's a primordial black hole. And this just sort of goes to explain why we haven't seen it yet, how we could have an object that is interfering with other objects in the outer solar system through its mass. And yet, it seems to be invisible, it's very hard to detect. Now, the most likely answer is just that it is faint, or that it is dark, or that it is like a little farther away than we thought, or it's just, we haven't scanned the sky with enough detail to be able to find it. But this kind of crazy theory is that it's a primordial black hole, a black hole left over from the formation of the universe, which is one possible explanation for dark matter, almost certainly not true. But you can't rule it out. So put it on there as the theory. So the question is like, how would you detect it? And black holes, even when they're not actively feeding will occasionally give off gamma radiation. The supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way does this from time to time. So when a little bit of material falls in it doesn't have to be a lot either, like an asteroid's worth of material falls into the supermassive black hole, it's such an extreme event that it releases this burst of gamma radiation. And so the theory is, is that if we do have this primordial black hole, it's still occasionally eating teeny tiny little bits of matter, the occasional hydrogen atom, it's releasing this little bit of gamma radiation as these annihilations occur, I guess, as this material is added to the mass of the black hole. 
and you get little pops of, of gamma radiation that could be detectable if you had a spacecraft out there looking for it. So that's how you might be able to find it. But it's a long shot. Brandon Lewisides, how do the gamma rays escape the gravity of the black hole? The gamma rays are not coming from the black hole itself, they're coming from the event horizon. And so you can imagine as some tiny asteroid, some tiny little piece of dust slams into the primordial black holes event horizon, the dust gets smashed up, turned into plasma. And the plasma, just as it's going into the event horizon of the black hole releases a little chirp of gamma radiation. And it's that gamma radiation that you detect. So it's coming from just outside the event horizon. And it's the same case whenever we detect gamma radiation coming from black holes across the universe, we're not detecting it from within the black holes event horizon, we're detecting it essentially matter that just about to die. The moments that it's dying, it is melting and releasing this gamma radiation. Jarhead. Any alternative theories to the Big Bang that you find convincing? I'm a journalist, not an astronomer. And so I don't know enough to know what is convincing and what is not convincing. Um, and I've, you know, like maybe earlier, when I knew less, I was a lot more enthusiastic and thought I knew more. And so I would I would have opinions about about alternative various theories and which things are more convincing. And I, over time, as I've mellowed out and just become more mature, I've realized that it's hopeless to have an opinion about science about nature about the about the way things work. That's not how science works. Like science is about almost blindly attempting to throw hypotheses out there and see if you can disprove them. And if you can't disprove them, then the theory has to stick around. Now, obviously, I just said that it's probably unlikely that planet nine is a primordial black hole. So maybe I do have opinions on this. So yeah, so I mean, there are there are a few but I, but I think the first thing that's really important to understand is that the Big Bang explains essentially that the universe is expanding that as we look out across the universe, we see galaxies moving away from us in all directions. And that's all the Big Bang is. It's sort of like the same thing with evolution. If you say like, what is the theory of evolution? The theory of evolution is that creatures are changing over time, as they pass on as their mutations and as as creatures adapt to new environments, and their offspring gain various traits that are better adapted and so on and so forth. It doesn't explain where life came from. It just explains that life adapts and it's beautiful, it beautifully explains the evidence that we see. And yet, where did the first life form come from? We have no idea. Nobody has any idea. That's, that's the theory of abiogenesis problem, not the theory of evolution's problem. And unfortunately, the Big Bang has been rolled up to not only explain the expansion of the universe, which again, is beautiful and elegant and well supported and has mountains of lines of evidence from the cosmic microwave background to the movement, the red shifting of galaxies moving away from us with the but where did the universe come from. And so it's like, if you can't explain where the universe came from, then that invalidates the Big Bang, but it doesn't like the Big Bang is about the expansion of the universe. And nobody has a problem with that. You won't be able to find very many people who disagree that the universe is growing less dense over time that galaxies are moving away from us that there was a cosmic microwave background, etc. Was there no universe and then suddenly universe is the universe in some kind of cycle that it will reach a point where it starts all over again? Um, was there some proto universe before the universe? We don't know. We have no idea. There doesn't seem to be any evidence. And even if inflation this idea that the universe expanded rapidly in the first few moments, and this explains a bunch of problems with the Big Bang nicely, beautifully, even if that is true, that still doesn't tell you where did the universe come from before the inflation happened? We don't know. We don't know. And so the best answer, the answer that I like is, you know, where did the universe come from? I don't know. I don't know. But I'd like to know, I'd like to find out. And so I look forward to more research, more science, more evidence, and we'll see what we see. Marco Cambre, where is the Tesla vehicle orbiting at the moment? So the Tesla vehicle was Elon Musk's 
Tesla Roadster that he put onto the Falcon Heavy to demonstrate its capability of launching heavy payloads out into space and with Starman flying the Roadster. And it was launched on an orbit that was going to take it out into the asteroid belt beyond the orbit of Mars, but not actually interact with Mars. And so it's like out by the asteroid belt now, and it's probably going to be making its way back closer to the inner solar system past the orbit of Earth at some point in the next couple of years, and then it's gonna go back out to the asteroid belt and just keep doing that. And maybe over the course of the next few million years, it might actually come really close to Earth and maybe even crash into the Earth. We don't know. But so right now, out around the asteroid belt, Andre Babumian, how do we know the shape of the Milky Way galaxy? And how do we know our location within it? That is a really tricky question. And this is something that astronomers have been trying to figure out for a very long time. And the analogy that I always use is like, imagine you're inside your house, and you're trying to draw what your house looks like, by watching as cars drive by outside, and you're seeing a brief reflection in the car window, kind of distorted. And then you use that to try to draw a little more of what your house looks like, the color where the windows are, the landscaping, etc. It's tricky. So in the past, Astronomers assumed that the sun was at the center of the Milky Way because they essentially saw Milky Way stars in all directions. And it wasn't until telescopes got better and better that they realized there was more of a density of the Milky Way in one direction than the other. And so they were able to get a sense like, okay, we are off to one side of the Milky Way. And of course, looking out into space, we see lots of other examples of galaxies we see Andromeda, and we see the pinwheel galaxy and triangulum and all these galaxies, which show us what a spiral galaxy can probably look like. But the exact shape and nature of the galaxy has been quite a mystery and astronomers have been arguing like, how many arms does the Milky Way have? Does it have a bar or no bar? And you'd be amazed, like even right now, astronomers will argue about whether or not the Milky Way has a bar at its center, exactly how many arms the Milky Way galaxy has, the, the size and the shape are still areas of debate. Now the best tool that's come along in the last couple of years is the Gaia spacecraft. And this is the mission that's doing this very careful measuring of the position and the movement of more than a billion stars in the Milky Way. And by doing that, it is measuring just with incredible precision, the shape of the Milky Way, and figuring out where we are in relation to everything. And we now have learned, like the Milky Way has a bit of a warp to the disk. We've learned the locations of the various galaxies that the Milky Way has absorbed over time. And so this idea and picture of the Milky Way is really coming into focus. Now it's kind of the golden age of understanding our position in the Milky Way. And it required this Gaia spacecraft, and it required mapping the position direction and movement of billions of stars, like a pretty significant fra well, okay, not a 1% of the Milky Way is giving us enough of a sense of the Milky Way's true shape in a level of clarity that if you could go back and tell an astronomer 100 years ago, okay, okay, here's how it looks, they would just be stunned at how well we can do it today. More questions in a second. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons, Schmore, Gary Mays, Bronze Monkey, Terry Trevino, Paul Robinson, and the rest of our 843 patrons for their generous support. Want our videos early with no ads? Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. Blue Red Brick. What is the distance to James Webb in light seconds or astronomical units? So James Webb is 1.5 million kilometers away from the Earth. And to travel 1.5 million kilometers, it takes light five seconds. And so if you want to communicate with James Webb, it's going to take five seconds for your signal to reach the telescope, and then five seconds for its reply to get back to Earth. So it's like a 10 second return time. And the distance measured in astronomical units is 1% of an astronomical unit, 0 0.01 astronomical units. So 1 100th the distance from the Earth to the Sun. And I did these calculations using Wolfram Alpha. And you can do the same. Just go to Wolfram Alpha and just type in 1.5 million kilometers in light seconds, and it'll give you the answer. Not that they're a sponsor. It's just like the I love it. It's the tool that I use for a lot of the weird calculations that I do uh, on these various shows. Endless Rage. Aren't the filament structures linking galaxy clusters together and interacting dark matter related? Kind of. 
So when you look at the universe at the largest scale, where you can see billions of light years in a single image, you see this incredible filamentary graphic that shows blobs connected by these lines and walls and stuff. And yet, if you actually zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, you'll start to look at galaxy clusters, and you will realize that these lines are actually galaxy clusters side by side by side. And if you zoom in more, you'll see that the galaxy clusters are made of individual galaxies, it's galaxies all the way down. And each one of these galaxies is surrounded by a halo of dark matter. And each one of these galaxy clusters is surrounded by a halo of dark matter. And as you look at those filaments, they are surrounded by a cylinder of dark matter. And the big biggest blobs are surrounded by dark matter. And what it really is, is that it's dark matter is defining this large scale structure of the universe. And this ties back to that original thing that we talked about these regions of over density and under density. So back when the entire observable universe was say the size of a volleyball, and then it expanded out with inflation to a much larger size, you had tiny little regions of over density and under density. And those mapped to the large scale structures of the universe that we see today. Amazing. Peter Manger. How do orbits become stable and stay stable? They seem like they shouldn't eclipse orbits and so many objects. If there was no interactions going on, then some object would orbit around another object forever. And so if there was just the sun and the earth, and that was it, then the earth would orbit around the sun at a perfect circular orbit, assuming it started out circular forever. But we know that actually, there's a whole bunch of planets in the solar system, not just Earth, but there's also Venus and there's Jupiter, right? It's got a lot of gravity and the gravitational interactions between all these worlds are slightly destabilizing the position changing the orbits over time. And there's like a non zero chance that Jupiter can actually kick out other planets in the solar system over vast periods of time, like longer than the sun will be around, Jupiter will start kicking out all of the planets one by one through these gravitational interactions, these slight perturbations. And then of course, Jupiter is causing with its gravity as it interacts with the asteroid belt, it is slowly shifting asteroids out of the asteroid belt and pushing them inward. And that's how you get near Earth asteroids is actually thanks to Jupiter. Jupiter is not our friend. Jupiter is our enemy. Although some asteroids do smash into Jupiter. So it's sort of like a fair weather. Friend. It's a friend of me. But in order to capture I guess what you probably are getting it, it's like it's like, how can you have say, a comet that is coming in from deep space from the Oort cloud, suddenly, somehow be going in orbit around the sun and for a much longer period of time. And so what you need is a three body interaction, you need two objects, the gravity of two objects to catch the asteroid or catch this object one after the other. And so one changes the orbit by a significant amount, and then the other object changes the orbit and that will circularize it, capture it, whatever. And so to get captured objects, I mean, like the classic example is like Triton, you know, Triton is going backwards around Neptune from the rest of the moons it had to have been captured somehow. And so there's probably some kind of three body interaction, Triton got captured by Neptune, maybe interactions with Uranus, maybe interactions with other moons around Neptune, and was able to go into orbit. And so you need these multiple planet interactions to have something get caught and be in a stable orbit. But at the end of the day, you know, as long as there's multiple objects in the solar system, orbits aren't stable. Um, you would have to remove everything else to make things perfectly stable, just have one object orbiting the sun, like our Dyson sphere. Alex Corley, given the great filter theory, how dangerous is the universe to life? Did we really win the lottery that much? The short answer is we just don't know. Like we don't know why we don't see evidence of other life. Life should be everywhere. The solar system should be crawling with von Neumann probes, we don't see it. And so one possibility is that we're first, that we are the most advanced civilization in the universe. And that seems laughable, because the chances of us being first, if there's life is everywhere, and the chances that we're the one that's first seems really remote, like there should be other civilizations that are ahead of us. And like, you know, the joke, haha, you know, 
we're not advanced, right? I, we're pretty advanced. The second possibility is that we are alone, that we're the only life in the universe. And that seems unlikely, but we don't know how likely that life is to form. It is somewhere between zero and 100% of planets are capable of forming life. And that number could be 0 0.000000001, like whatever is Earth divided by the Milky Way. Um, and that would get you life. And that could just be the number of, of planets in the, in the Milky Way that have life. Or maybe it's even worse. And it's the number of planets in the entire observable universe that have life. So we could be alone. The third possibility is this idea of the great filter, that there is some event that happens to all civilizations when they reach a certain point that snuffs them out of existence. And that's terrifying. And when you think about the possible great filters out there, none of them seem super plausible. Like, even if we had a nuclear war here on Earth, humanity would survive, life would survive. And you know, even if humanity didn't survive, the octopuses would rise up and, and take over. If we had the AI uprising, well, then the universe would be filled with von Neumann probes, and we don't see von Neumann probes everywhere. And so probably there wasn't an AI uprising out there. If there was a global pandemic, wouldn't kill it all life on Earth. So the possibility, and this is sort of like the existential horror nature of it, the kind of great filter is something that wipes out the entire planet, all life on the planet, because you don't want to let the the octopuses or the dolphins take a crack at it. That is probably instantaneous, that is unable, you cannot predict it, because it essentially had happened to every single advanced civilization out there in the universe 100% of the time, none of them saw it coming, right? And it happens 100% of the time, impossible to predict happens all the time, completely annihilates the civilization, there is no way to predict it. That's terrifying. Like I imagine some kind of science experiment that gobbles up your planet at the speed of light. And the planet just sniffed out of the universe. Like, that's what it would have to be to fulfill the great filter. So um, the universe is not dangerous to life. There are lots of places that seem perfectly habitable. We know of many of them here in the solar system. Uh, it's just, it's a mystery. We don't know the answer to it. And I hope we figure it out. Hage plays. What do you think about the dark force theory? I've talked about this a bit in the past as a explanation to the Fermi paradox. The dark forest theory is that civilizations learn to hide because there are other civilizations out there looking for them. And if you hide, then someone won't try to send a berserker probe over to destroy your world. Uh, and the concept comes from the three body problem series, the, the dark forest, which is the second book, which is excellent, but I'm not convinced. I don't think it's that compelling, a, a an idea. We with James Webb are going to be able to detect the atmospheres of worlds around us. Imagine a super James Webb, a telescope that is maybe 100 times bigger than James Webb, we will be reading the newspapers of aliens on other worlds around us. So we will be able to see them directly, we can detect that there's life, we can detect their air pollution, we will be able to see the mountains on their world, we'll be able to see the light pollution from their cities, we'll be able to see their orbital structures. Imagine a telescope that is the size, you know, with interferometry of the Earth's orbit. Imagine we send a telescope out to 1000 AU and we use the sun as a gravitational lens, we could be observing features a few meters across on on other planets. So the dark force theory doesn't really convince me because the ability to observe will always be there and very powerful. And it's very difficult to hide your entire civilization, the existence of life on your planet from the stars around you. So it the aliens know we're here. And we're about to know where they are, if they're there. And so I don't I don't buy the, the dark force theory. James Huffman. If you haven't, can we talk about how rubble pile asteroids are likely dead comets? When I heard that, I was just like, oh, that seems like so the right answer. Yeah, this is a new piece of research that came out in the last couple of weeks by people working with the Hayabusa 2 data on Ryugu. And a couple of these asteroids that we've seen, Bennu, Ryugu, 
they're calling them rubble pile asteroids. And the idea was that at one point, it was more like a solid object or two rocks that were crashing into each other. And they obliterated each other and turned into just a cloud of boulders. And then the boulders came back down together and formed this ball, this rubble ball. And maybe it happened multiple times, they smashed another things, blow up then reform because the gravity is weak, but it can kind of pull this cloud of shrapnel back together, and you get this rubble pile asteroid. But the new theory, and I love it, I don't know whether it's, you know, the evidence will hold, but that actually Ryuga was once a comet. And all of the rocks were actually just boulders mixed in with this much larger comet. And over time, the sun blasted away all of the volatiles, all the water, all of the ammonia, methane, all of that stuff. And the comet got smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually, all that was left was the rocks, the boulders. It's kind of a cool idea. Um, I guess we'll find out if it's if it's true or not. Popcorn power. Could some galaxies be better for life than others, maybe based on age and the amount of heavier elements available? Yeah, in, in theory, you know, we know that here in the Milky Way, there are regions of the Milky Way that are probably better for the life than others. So at the core of the Milky Way, there's definitely lots of energy, there's lots of metals and materials that you would want. But there's also a lot of radiation. So it would be a very dangerous place stars are very close to each other. They're probably interacting with each other, tearing each other's planets away, bathing each other in cosmic radiation sounds kind of dangerous. In the outer stretches of the Milky Way, we know that the stars are less dense, less radiation, but also probably more metal poor, probably the star systems have less usable elements for life to form. It's sort of this middle zone. And astronomers argue about how big this habitable zone of the galaxy is. Some people argue that it's actually fairly wide that most of the galaxy is probably habitable. So you would want to find a galaxy that is more of the middle stuff and and less of the outer rim and the deadly core. And so probably there are galaxies that are that are more habitable than others. John Holleran, you talked about Dyson spheres and how they would be unstable around their star. Would a Dyson sphere be able to use the solar wind as an ion like drive for station keeping? I was sort of I was right away, I was gonna say no, but I'm sort of like imagining like, could you inflate a Dyson sphere, like a balloon, but even if you did, it would still be not perfectly balanced. The problem is the Dyson spheres are unstable. So you've got say the sun, you've got Earth going around Earth is going at 30 kilometers per second. And it's being held by the sun's gravity and those two forces, the force of it essentially trying to fly off into space and the force of gravity of the sun, keep it perfectly in balance. It goes around the sun around and around and around. But say you make a ring world. Now you've got an object that is no longer essentially trying to escape. You've got it's perfectly rigid. The one side of the ring world is holding the other side together. And now all you've got is the gravity of the sun trying to pull it inward and eventually instabilities of it would pull it in to the star Dyson sphere, same thing right that the sun is you know the thing could be orbiting in some way but it's not in balance and so the dyson sphere will float around and eventually crash into the sun and melt it and so i guess what you're asking is like could you inflate the dyson sphere with the solar wind and i guess in theory if your dyson sphere was made of light enough material that it would act like a solar sail bubble around the sun and the light pressure, the photons of the sun would keep this whole thing inflated, but it would also like be heating it up. And so I'm guessing there's like a pile of forces, you know, the solar winds pushing outward, the radiation from the sun is pushing outward, the gravity from the sun that's pulling inward trying to bring this material back into the sun. And maybe you could I mean, maybe there could be this perfect balance where it is inflating. And but I wonder it wouldn't still balance right like the sun would would be inflating this area. But would it stay equally distant away from all the parts of the sun? I guess it would as a as one part of the Dyson sphere got closer then it would the the radiative pressure would be stronger. And so it would sort of push it away. So I guess if you made your Dyson sphere, like a few micrometers thick, then maybe that would work. I don't know. I don't know. I'm sort of I'm really spitballing at this point. Okay, those are all the questions for this week's question show. Thank you everyone who asked them either on the YouTube comments anywhere across my channel, or the people who showed up for the live show. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Super fun. And we'll see you next week.
If you want a single comprehensive resource for space news, you want to subscribe to my weekly email newsletter. Every Friday, I send out a magazine of space news with dozens of stories, pictures, brief highlights, and links you can find out more. Go to university.com slash newsletter to sign up. It's totally free. And did you know that all of my videos are also available in a handy audio podcast format so that you can have the latest episodes as well as special bonus material like interviews with me show up on your audio device. Go to university.com slash audio or search for universe today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And I'll put a link in the show notes. Thanks to all the moderators and a special thanks as always, Chad Weber and Nancy Graziano.